I think uh, it's time to start this uh, fantastic uh, webinar and I want to thank the organizers for having put together this uh, great occasion to share our, uh, our uh, uh, knowledge, our experience. Uh, I think uh, it would be extremely important uh, to discuss what is our uh, experience and uh, our uh, knowledge uh, in the area of uh, COVID. As you can see, there is here a, an Italian and Chinese uh, uh, flag together because uh, what I want to do is to warmly thank our Chinese friends for all the gifts uh, they have sent, masks, they have sent coats, they have sent uh, different uh, 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 personal protection devices to us in this moment of crisis. Um, as you have seen from the panel, uh, I will be accompanied in this endeavor by Zion Peng, an old friend uh, from uh, Wuhan, who is director of intensive care unit over there, but we also will have uh, uh, the experience shared by other people like Syed Mohamed Reza Hashamian from Iran, Omar Mayujud from Morocco, Neta Chai Shishrat from Thailand, Ranista Ratanarat from Thailand, who has been uh, a fellow in our division, and Liang Yu from China, the department of Zhejiang province in China. I would like to take the lead in presentation and discuss the fact that as you see and as you know, there are areas of the planet where the case reporting in the last seven days has been climbing and rising tremendously. Among them, uh, we should consider uh, now United States and Spain, uh, the areas that uh, have been more uh, uh, involved in the rise of cases. Uh, Italy is still uh, uh, climbing, not rising the peak yet. And fortunately enough, in China, we are now seeing a kind of a remission of the epidemic. It is interesting to see, however, that uh, in the most recent, uh, uh, let's say, times, Europe is uh, climbing significantly, as well as the Eastern Mediterranean areas. And I think that uh, there is an important, uh, important effect in the area of Americas. We have mostly news from the North America. Uh, maybe someone will help us uh, giving information about South America. Now, um, I think that uh, it is important to try to uh, organize this meeting in the, in the, following, uh, in the following way. Uh, at the end of the presentations, hopefully, we will have uh, the possibility to uh, uh, make questions, especially through the uh, uh, chat system or rising hands. Now, we are coming from the experience of the severe acute respiratory syndrome, uh, which was an atypical pneumonia caused by the SARS coronavirus appeared for the first time in Guangdong province that goes from November 2002 to July 2003, uh, more than 8,000 cases and approximately 800 deaths. Since 2004, we have no further information about this. Bats and small mammalians were involved. The Middle East respiratory syndrome called MERS is another disease involved by coronavirus. Uh, and at the end of November 2019, a total of 2,500 cases were reported in the Middle East, including 858 associated deaths. Majority of cases were reported from Saudi Arabia. I think this was identified for the first time in 2012, 
and then includes different clinical pictures from a symptomatic uh, uh, disease to an acute respiratory distress syndrome and multiple organ failure. Camels were considered the source of transmission and droplets were identified as the likely mechanism. We have seen different uh, jump of species uh, for influenza virus H5N1, H1N1, the swine influenza, and now we are seeing this new devastating uh, epidemic of coronavirus uh, that uh, very likely made the jump from species through a, a pangolin uh, uh, species to the human being. What is a common observation around the world is a specific type of pneumonia that is not easy to see in other conditions. There are conditions that are non-severe, there are conditions that are severe, but what is striking is very, very uh, often the quick passage from a condition almost asymptomatic to a very severe dyspnea and a very severe condition just in few, in few hours. We are aware today that uh, the glycoproteins forming the so-called spikes of the coronavirus uh, uh, have uh, the ACE2 uh, receptor as a, a, a site for attachment to the human uh, uh, alveolar cells and bronchial cells. And at this point, uh, the uh, entering the virus uh, become uh, the uh, cause of the, of the uh, infection. Now, it is interesting to consider that uh, angiotensin converting enzyme, which is a membrane bound amino peptidase that has a vital role in the cardiovascular and immune system, is involved in heart function and development of hypertension, diabetes, and other disease. In addition, this has been identified as a functional receptor for coronavirus. At this point, the infection is triggered by binding of the spike protein of the virus uh, to the ACE2 receptor, which is highly expressed in the heart and lungs. For this reason, I think that uh, it is extremely important uh, to consider patients who are uh, undergoing antihypertensive therapy with ACE inhibitors because they tend to express more ACE2 receptors and also it should be considered the important effect that the virus has on the cardiovascular system. As a matter of fact, in this paper, it has been uh, established that a particular attention should be given to cardiovascular protection during treatment for COVID-19. Now we have uh, uh, time ago, especially looking at the problem of sepsis, identify how much different organs may interact in the so-called organ crosstalk. There is a physiological transmission of signals between different organs, cardiorenal, hepatorenal, lung and renal, and all these different uh, interactions may lead to a, a situation of multiple organ dysfunction. At this point, uh, we have also identified the concept of echoes, which means e extracorporeal uh, organ support system. This uh, extracorporeal organ support uh, is provided by different types of circuits, different types of uh, devices, and different types of uh, filters that may go from uh, VV to VA ECMO, uh, oxygenation through a membrane, an extracorporeal membrane, CO2 removal, ultrafiltration for, uh, uh, let's say, support of the heart, uh, CRRT for the therapy uh, uh, that replaces renal function, plasma filtration or plasma exchange, hemoperfusion, and we will discuss specifically this today, albumin dialysis, coupled plasma filtration, absorption, and so on. Basically, these therapies are all part of what we call an integrated approach to sepsis. And in this case, it could be an integrated approach to our COVID-19 patients. 
because infection that normally with bacteria induce endotoxin, in this case, will have viral particles inducing a specific immune response, both at the organ, tissue, and cell level. And at this point, uh, cytokines and chemokines can be uh, uh, somehow part of the so-called cytokine storm that could be partially modulated by a specific therapy that we will see in a minute. This may prevent pro progression towards organ damage, which is normally induced by uh, the effect of uh, 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 chemicals. Now, this is uh, uh, a condition in which uh, the immunosystem produces a massive activation of the immunosystem with uh, extreme release of cytokines and activation of different type of cells of the immune response. Severe complication may be uh, therefore involving different cytokines from interferon gamma to TNF alpha to interleukin 6, 10, 12, 16, 17, and 18. What is interesting, and Hotchkiss has clearly demonstrated, there might be a counter anti-inflammatory uh, secretion of cytokines that may induce in long term, in some cases, immunoparalysis. What is the organ effect of the cytokine storm? Well, first of all, like a lung injury that uh, lungs could be an early target and also later on uh, may end up uh, in a fibrotic uh, repair. Shock, the uh, endothelial cells are extremely sensitive to cytokines uh, and these patients may need the vasopressor. This can be actually the trigger for our therapies because we identify patients that are under need of vasopressor. Altered coagulation, these patients show very often uh, hypercoagulability and this is one of the aspects that we have seen in almost all the patients. Renal failure may happen. Normally, it comes uh, after a while, not uh, as a starting clinical picture. And finally, systemic capillary leak syndrome that show that this patient can only be maintained in hemodynamic support uh, using vasopressors. Uh, interleukin cis has been considered one of the most important cytokines, and for this reason, uh, we have uh, elucidated the fact that interleukin-6 produced by different B, T cell, macrophages, endothelial cell, mast cell, fibroblast, and others uh, may be overwhelming in concentration in case of patients with severe pulmonary infection by coronavirus. Uh, they may be triggered by other cytokines in a kind of vicious circle of amplification of the production and spill over into the circulation. Now, the effects at the clinical level are definitely fever, cough, shortness of breath, myalgia, arthralgias, fatigue, uh, low albumin, elevated CRP, elevated ESR, elevated LDH, ferritin, and interleukin-6. One of the symptoms that has been identified recently is the loss of smelling capacity and the taste capacity. For this reason, different uh, drugs have been tried, including uh, the so-called anti-interleukin-6 drug called tucilizumab. And tucilizumab-4, uh, given at a certain dosage, uh, has been shown to present some uh, results. There are other uh, drugs that have been uh, somehow uh, uh, identified and recently uh, there is another drug from Japan, Avigan, that has been proposed for the treatment. In summary, the cytokine storm in case of coronavirus infection may require an early treatment to block or modulate interleukin-6 and other cytokines to avoid progression towards uh, the uh, organ, uh, organ failure. But the question that we have today is, do we have other options? And other options uh, may come from the analysis of what many years ago we considered the so-called peak concentration hypothesis. 
after any type of injury or trigger to secretion of uh, cytokines and immune response, there is a first a pro-inflammatory response and subsequently an anti-inflammatory response. And as in the paper of Hodgkiss and colleagues, some patients may die because in controllable inflammatory syndrome, other patients may die because uh, of uh, uncontrollable anti-inflammatory syndrome or immunoparalysis. There seems to be a threshold and it would be interesting to try to develop a therapy that may cut the peak concentration of these uh, substances. As you can see here, the pro-inflammatory response may end up with the anti-inflammatory response, but survival is only achieved when you maintain a certain equilibrium between the two. Studying the circulating cytokines may not be uh, completely, uh, uh, may be misleading because as it has been shown by the cytokinetic model by Kellum, Rimele and others, the circulating level of cytokines uh, may change very rapidly and there may be a kind of kinetic uh, uh, gradient uh, of concentration between tissues and circulating level in the blood. For this reason, measuring blood level of cytokines may not be accurate and may not tell you the whole story, even if you remove a large amount of cytokines. In this case, in fact, blood purification may act at the blood level, but uh, due to a, a gradient uh, uh, of cytokines between uh, tissue and the blood, there might be a movement of these substances from the tissue to the blood. This is very important because also removing from the blood may redirect the response of the immune system to the place where it is highly needed. So the mediator removal, as I mentioned in the past, may not look for a magic bullet. One single drug, one single cytokine may not be the answer. We need a magic shield a magic shield that provides protection from different types of cytokines. Now, as we have seen for uh, uh, sepsis, when you have COVID infection, the immune response can be overwhelming and the presence of cytokines can be somehow modulated by different types of extracorporeal therapies. More recently, we have experienced most of them uh, hemoperfusion as a way to absorb cytokines during uh, the so-called cytokine storm. Absorption may occur on the surface of specific neutral microporous raisins, which are absorbing the high amounts of uh, substances. I must uh, remind you that uh, absorption may occur also for other substances like antibiotics. So if you treat a patient, for example, for three, four hours, six hours with absorption therapy, you have to deliver antibiotics and other therapies after this therapy to avoid absorption and elimination of the drugs that you are actually uh, delivering. Also, we have recently studied the blood, uh, in uh, blood purification, uh, the uh, biocompatibility of these solvents, which seems to be excellent, avoiding a specific unwanted uh, reaction on the surface. We published uh, recently this paper where we uh, propose uh, the uh, mechanism by which uh, uh, absorption can be uh, beneficial for this patient. And the idea is the following. When viral infection occurs and pneumonia occurs, you might land up uh, with the immune response uh, of pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory cytokines. This can be further amplified uh, by the um, ventilator-induced uh, lung injury and by ECMO in case you're using this. And this may lead actually to endothelial damage, dysfunction, shock, and finally organ failure. Now, if you apply the therapies that uh, we have mentioned before, you may actually do this uh, isolated or in combination with CRRT, and you can actually cut the peaks of both pro and anti-inflammatory mediators exactly in the moment when this is needed. 
The problem is that because we cannot monitor the uh, uh, we cannot monitor the the, the cytokines, uh, uh, the system will self-regulate, removing more of the uh, of the uh, um, of the of the cytokines that have the highest concentration in blood, thus increasing protection of the endothelial level and preventing, if possible, organ support. With this, I used all my 20 minutes, and uh, I would like now to give uh, the word for another 20 meeting minutes to my friend uh, Zi Yong Peng. Uh, who will uh, actually share his, uh, his, uh, mm, his uh, uh, desktop and uh, will present uh, with slide uh, his uh, experience. Peng, are you there? Peng, you have to unmute. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, so I stop sharing my, and uh, you have to share your desktop. Okay. How are you, by the way? Okay, so, oh, hello, uh, everyone. Uh, I'm a doctor parent uh, from uh, Department of Critical Care Medicine, Wuhan University. It's my great honor to share my experience uh, with you. Today, my topic is uh, blood purification used in critical ear COVID-19 patients. Uh, I will briefly talk about the general features of the COVID-19 and uh, blood purification in the critical ER uh, COVID-19 patients. And uh, the last, I will share uh, a case series uh, with you about uh, how we used uh, the blood purification in the patients. Okay, so here is the basic features of the COVID-19 uh, from our uh, uh, papers. And uh, you can see the, the age and the comorbidities. And also you, uh, you, can, you can compare the patients uh, with in the ICU or, uh, or uh, outside the ICU. And the patient in the ICU is relatively older and uh, with much more comorbidities uh, compared to the patients uh, 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 outside the ICU. And uh, this is the the typical symptoms uh, from the patients of COVID-19. And uh, most of the patients uh, had fever, fatigue, dry cough, myalgia, and uh, dyspnea. And about 10% of the patients uh, presented initially with the abdominal symptoms and they gradually uh, developed uh, of fever and dyspnea. And, uh, uh, and you can compare the patients with ICU and outside ICU. And patients in the ICU uh, have relatively high instance of the uh, dyspnea and the abdominal symptoms. This is the clini clinical process of the disease. At the time from onset to dyspnea is uh, around five days. Uh, seven days to the uh, hospital admission and eight days uh, to the uh, ARDS development. So this is the lab uh, test for the patients uh, with COVID-19. The typical lab result is the lymphopenia and uh, uh, also uh, elevated DSH and the patients uh, in the ICU, it uh, has relatively lower lymphocyte cost and higher uh, LDH. So this is the uh, typical chest CT uh, from the patients of the COVID-19. Very typical uh, ground glass op opacity, uh, 
uh, initially uh, from a peripheral area and then diffuse to the whole area of the lungs. Uh, the diagnosis, uh, the, the like diagnosis criteria, including the uh, history, uh, typical symptoms, uh, lab test, and also we need to exclude the, the flu and the other uh, virus test, other virus, and also the also include the typical chest CT, uh, RT RT PCR virus test. Uh, so also if uh, the ask the PCR test negative and we still suspect the patients. So we will run the, the serology test to detect any antibody uh, in the body. And the confirmed diagnosis, including the, the symptoms, lab test, typ uh, typical chest CT, and uh, uh, positive viral test, uh, whether or not it's the PCR or the serology test. So clinical diagnosis, all the symptoms, lab test, uh, typical, typical chest CD, but uh, without the uh, positive viral test. So this is the uh, features uh, for the patient in the ICU. And uh, you can see the, the APK2 score, SOVA score, actually is not, not high uh, initially, but the, the P4 ratio is quite lower uh, when the patients uh, admitted in the ICU. And uh, also, the, uh, most of the patients uh, complicated with ARDS, uh, secondary to uh, cardiac injury and shock. Uh, around 8% of the patients uh, complicated with the AGI. So this is the, our uh, first uh, database in the first months in our ICU. And also this, uh, uh, about nearly, nearly half of the patients requiring uh, intubation and some patients uh, switch to the ECMO. So, uh, this data is, is uh, from our uh, current uh, patients, uh, relatively uh, severe compared to the, to the patient in the first months because these patients uh, transferred from other hospitals, transferred from other ICUs. And you can see the P4 ratio quite low. And also uh, almost 70% uh, of the patients uh, requiring uh, intubation, and uh, uh, one third of the patients uh, also uh, requiring ECMO. Most of the patients uh, received prolonged position ventilation, and 90% uh, uh, of the patients uh, had ARDS, and 40% of the patients uh, had uh, complicated with shock, and uh, also. Uh, more than 20% of the patients complicated with the AKI. So uh, next, I will briefly talk about the uh, blood purification used in the uh, COVID-19 patients. And uh, of, uh, of course, first we need to know uh, the epidemiology of the AKI uh, uh, from the COVID-19. As just uh, we mentioned, so it depends on the data. So the data is the around uh, six percent to almost thirty percent based on the different database. So the AKI distance is uh, is uh, variable. Uh, also, the uh, pathophysiology of the AKI. So I mean, the uh, most of the AKI probably is the. Uh, did maybe detect it from uh, the virus, uh, uh, from the virus invasion, also uh, caused by the hypoxemia and uh, uh, renal hyperperfusion, uh, also uh, cytokine and other uh, uh, abnormal and other uh, uh, and other mediators reduced by the uh, 
abnormal immune response. So just like uh, uh, Professor Ronke mentioned. So here is the uh, talk about the you know the cytokine storm syndrome. Uh, just mentioned is the uh, when the patients uh, uh, complicated with the syndrome, uh, you can see the lot of the cytokine we are released uh, from the from the body, and uh, uh, we can measure the high level of the uh, cytokines in the from the from the from the serum of the patient, and also uh, those kind of patients complicated with very severe uh, multi organ failures. So, so here is the a lot of the uh, concerts or recommendation in China. So this is a one concerts uh, about the, the blood production used in the COVID nineteen patients, and also suggest that the blood absorption should be started at the early stage of the of the inflammation, and the uh, predominance of the pro inflammatory response. Uh, uh, cytokines in the COVID-19 patients. And also the, the talk about the, uh, the principle and uh, why, we, we use the, why we should use the absorption uh, for the patient because the, one of the uh, mechanisms is the, uh, is the cytokine storm syndrome we just mentioned. Also just uh, uh, Professor uh, Ronko mentioned the, the details. I won't repeat uh, this. Uh, theory. So also uh, recommend about the plasma viruses should be considered for the patient with severe uh, COVID-19. And also uh, suggested uh, we can use this technique combined with our routine CRT if the patients uh, complicated with the AKI. So here is the uh, the national guidelines uh, for the diagnosis and the treatments uh, uh, for the COVID-19 patients. <coughs> also, to the, also mentioned about the treatment for the severe cases, or, uh, including the you know the uh, different organ supports, respiratory supports, circulatory supports, renal, re, renal replacement therapy, and uh, use the uh, uh, you know the covalent plasma infusion, also uh, including the blood purification uh, techniques uh, used for the patients uh, with the uh, cytokine storm. So last, I will briefly uh, share uh, our case series uh, with the blood blood purification uh, from our patients. So here uh, we have uh, three cases just recently. Uh, this patient is relatively older, almost 70 years old, and developed severe ARDS due to COVID-19. And the uh, APT2 score quite high, you see 30, SOAS score quite high, PFO ratio very, very low. And this patient uh, received the intervention uh, and uh, subsequently uh, switched to the ECMO. And the patient also complicated with the uh, sepsis and AKI. And also we given the CRT and the option for the patients. So uh, we give the uh, hemosorption and we measure the, the cytokines uh, before and after treatment. So you can see the this is the cytokine, including the IL-6, IL-1, IL-2, IL-8, TNF-alpha, IL-10, and also in, uh, the uh, CRP, <coughs> the C-response protein. Also, you can see the after treatment, uh, significant decreased uh, the cytokines, especially for the IL-6, almost, uh, uh, almost the only only uh, one third, one third uh, of the level compared to the uh, to the pre treatment. So uh, here is the hemodynamics uh, we measured with the long F frame. 
not be affluent, divided by the map. Also, uh, after treatment, this uh, parameters uh, significantly decreased. Uh, so means the after treatment, the uh, uh, improved the hemodynamic significantly. Also, lactate level decreased. Sofa score decreased. Leukocyte uh, decreased. <coughs> so here is about the the, ox the oxygenation and lung function uh, before and after treatment, and you can see the the P4 ratio also uh, improved, and the lung compliance also uh, increased. The people uh, decreased. Carbon dioxide uh, decreased. ECMO uh, parameters also uh, decreased. So finally, the outcome. So one patient uh, winning from the ECMO and the ventilator and uh, discharged from IC already. And one died, uh, the last one still on ECMO. So although these patients are relatively older, but we still give the treatment for them to make, make the patient have the chance to survive. Uh, so here I uh, recommend the HA3A2. Uh, uh, used as the hemoperfusion uh, for our patient because this uh, column uh, uh, was was been uh, reported already to remove the cytokines and also used in the different uh, uh, scenario such as the ARDS, septic shock, and uh, uh, also the ECMO treatment. So it serves it can could be uh, significantly removed for the cytokines and improve the the vital signs for the patients. So here's the the uh, recommended the use the uh, two one one therapy is the for the for the COVID nineteen patients. So it means that in the first day we use the two times, and the the last the the, the third. The second day and the third day we used we used the uh, one time so this is the uh, a cause for the uh, hemo uh, perfusion uh, used with ha 380 and also uh, we can uh, combine the, with the uh, ha 380 to uh, our ECMO or the RT machine. So here, in summary, the clinical here patients uh, tend to be older uh, with more, much more comorbidities uh, and also with uh, some uh, uh, atypical le level test. So the most common complication was ARDS. The instance of, AR, uh, of the AKI so was around 20%. Uh, so blood purification could be used in patients with AKI and uh, cytokine storm. Hemosorption uh, was demonstrated to remove cytokines, uh, improve uh, the hemodynamics and the oxygenation uh, from our uh, preliminary uh, report. Uh, thank you uh, for your patience. Thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to take any questions from you. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Peng. Uh, I think uh, we gave uh, the audience uh, a, a series of uh, information and I got uh, already a few questions that we may address and I will ask you to comment as well. I will try to answer first and then I will give you the word uh, to answer. First question is, uh, why do I think that adsorption is probably the best mechanism for uh, this removal of cytokines? Well, the reason is that the cytokines have a high molecular weight in most cases, uh, sometimes are bound to proteins. Uh, they are like TNF uh, uh, aggregated in trimeric uh, structures and most of them cannot be cleared by classic dialysis membranes or hemofiltration membranes. They may in part be removed by high cutoff membrane, but at the price and the cost of uh, uh, loss of albumin. 
Um, therefore, I think that direct absorption into the blood causes a specific removal of substances like cytokines at the level that no other system can provide. There are today, however, membranes for uh, CRRT that can actually provide some absorption like uh, AN69 modified or like uh, polymethylmethacrylate. However, uh, using a membrane for absorption is probably less logical than using a direct sorber device. Another question is relevant to anticoagulation. Uh, we see in this patient uh, a very typical hypercoagulability state and we use basically heparin. People may use uh, citrate, however, citrate require more attention and uh, uh, more interventions at the circuit level. And when, as in the case now in Italy, intensive care uh, teams are extremely occupied in dealing with a lot of patients, the problem may be that heparin can be the simplest way to approach anticoagulation. Another question is uh, what is the evidence uh, that using uh, uh, hemoperfusion is uh, beneficial for the patient? Well, in presence of uh, no evidence uh, for any of the drugs that are currently used, I think that at least uh, we should content ourselves with the rational and the rational is there and the clinical results are somehow uh, supporting this uh, rational. We will never be able to do a randomized control trial as uh, somebody would like to see because of the difficulty in running a, a, a trial in this uh, area. Another question is, uh, what is triggering the start of hemoperfusion therapy? Well, we have recently, for example, analyzed the use of nephrocheck and AKI biomarkers. When we uh, detect an initial stress of the tubular uh, cell level, uh, we suppose that this is induced by the cytokine levels and therefore in this patient together with the condition of high inflammatory parameters like CRP and uh, uh, lactate and, uh, and uh, uh, low albumin, we tend to start early hemoperfusion in, uh, in this patient. Furthermore, the need of vasopressor is one of the uh, triggers for us to initiate, uh, to initiate the therapy. Uh, there are a couple of other questions related to the, uh, what is the difference between the 380 and 330 cartridges? I think that uh, the production uh, line by the company now has uh, directed the, the final product to the HA380 and HA330 in the future will not be available uh, uh, anymore. Uh, last question that I see here is uh, when we have a CVVH or CVHDF, what uh, flow rates do we use? Well, let's say that uh, in uh, many patients, we tend to have as high as possible blood flow in order to reduce and minimize uh, clotting of the filter. Plus, we tend to use mostly diffusive therapies because uh, they have lower filtration fraction and they decrease hemoconcentration inside the filter so that clotting is prevented as well. And finally, uh, I think uh, in some patient, because this patient may need to be transferred to prone positioning, um, very often we do treatment for 12 hours a day instead of doing uh, 24 hours uh, a day. Um, question for Dr. Peng, I think is, uh, uh, concerning the fact that most cases have normal PCO2 in spite of hypoxemia. How do you explain this? Peng? Okay, okay. so uh, 
would you mind repeat so I just the signal is not good for me oh okay many patients display normal PCO2 in spite they are hypoxemic uh, So I mean, it's the uh, most of the most of the patients uh, in the early stage, the the CO2 is not is not high, but in the later stage, the CO2 increased. So the in in some in how many patients? What percent of patients did you use ECMO? Okay. So uh, based on our uh, data, uh, uh, we have used uh, about, uh, uh, I mean, uh, around the, a lot of ten percent, ten percent of the patients in our ICU okay. received ECMO already. Okay, uh, many people are asking if uh, hemoperfusion uh should be or can be used in the absence of aki or uh, in patients that do not require crt my answer is absolutely yes in fact uh, uh, you want to prevent the need for crt by using early hemoperfusion uh, in some patients uh, however we have a session uh, following the hemoperfusion of 6 to 12 hours because they need uh, fluid removal. Some of these patients uh, are fluid overloaded and uh, diuresis is not uh, uh, enough. Um, concerning the effectiveness of uh, HA380 uh, compared to HA330, we have found uh, a little higher capacity of uh, uh, absorption, so the the uh, use of the cartridge can probably be extended uh, over time. Uh, I think that mostly uh, we found uh, most of the answer of the questions similar. Uh, one question asks when to stop uh, this therapy. I think that uh, uh, Peng has clearly uh, suggested to use a regime which is two sessions in the first day and then one session next day and then one session next day. Uh, after this, uh, you either have resolved the situation or there will be no further effect probably for the, uh, for the uh, uh, patient. Is tuchilizumab removed during hemoperfusion? We didn't have uh, time to do the study yet, but it is supposed uh, so. So we have to administer tuchilizumab uh, uh, possibly after hemoperfusion. Um, uh, how do we perform absorption techniques? Uh, basically, it's a typical extracorporeal circuit. We use a, a dialysis a machine, a, a CRRT machine. I have seen Peng utilizing in the recommendation the multifiltrate, for example, but uh, uh, you can use it also with other uh, uh, machines like uh, the uh, uh, Plus Auto. You can use the the the, the Diapact uh, and different others. Uh, there is a question here about uh, uh, cytosorb. Cytosorb is another uh, um, uh, option, uh, another product, another sorbent, and basically I think that this is uh, uh, equally, equally important. Uh, uh, I don't think uh, uh, we want to promote a specific uh, uh, product. What we want to do is to promote a specific therapy, which is uh, which is uh, uh, absorption. Um, Professor Peng, there is a question for you. Uh, 
you propose the, the 211 uh, regime therapy. How long uh, is each session uh, in your experience? Peng? Hi. Is the how, for the how long? For the, okay, for the uh, 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 two one one uh, uh, regime and also uh, one uh, treatment for the for at least the four hours. At least four hours. Yes. Okay. Uh, it should be said that uh, in the recommendation of the product is written two hours and a half. So I think we can extend up to two, four hours. Yes. Okay. Um, another question here say, how about using cytosorb or oxidase filter? Again, I think that any method that can uh, uh, try to remove cytokine is welcome. It is probably more logical to use sorbents uh, than membranes, but again, uh, uh, sorbent can be followed probably by the use of an oxidase filter to combine also uh, blood purification with the uh, cytokine removal. What percent of patients survived? In our experience, I must say, uh, we have treated so far five patients and all of them have survived and uh, are now towards an improved uh, uh, clinical condition. What is your experience, Peng? So, uh, so because the, we use uh, the hemoabsorption, uh, uh, hemoperfusion, uh, only in the patient with, with the uh, severe, uh, severe, you know, severe ARDS. And also, also the septic shock, and you can see the you know the the reports we we present. They are very very old, very very sick. Of course, the mortality is quite high, but the but the based on the you know the calculated mortality, which the you know the the mortality is still lower compared to the calculated mortality. So if without the, the treatment, all the patients will die. But the, Still, some patients can survive, so we, we we cannot we cannot compare because we didn't do the the randomized uh, study for the patients. Well, I have uh, had the chance uh, to review a paper uh, in which they compare twenty four patients treated with hemoperfusion with twenty four patients treated with uh, uh, standard therapy and the difference in mortality was significant. I cannot mention where it is coming from, uh, nor the journal yet, but I think that if this paper will be published, this will be very, very important. Peng, I have another question, uh, which is coming from uh, another attendee, and it is, how do you explain that in China, uh, there was more than 30% patient developing AKI why in, uh, in several of other centers, including ours, I must say, the incidence is not higher than 10%. So, uh, so actually, I, I also compare the, the patient in our ICU uh, from the first month. The, the first month is the AKI, AKI instance is less than, less than 10, it's only 8%. But the second month is the more than 25%. Because the because the, the patient is transferred from other hospital, transferred from other ICUs, so they are very very severe. Okay, uh, yeah. I must say that in our experience, uh, uh, AKI, thanks God, is not so common. Uh, but in severe patient, the early application of this technique has also provided probably kind of prevention of developing AKI. Now, uh, one of the questions is, what are the criteria for indication of an early application of hemoabsorption in COVID patient? As I mentioned before, patient with uh, uh, high SOFA score 
uh, hemodynamic instability, high level of uh, uh, pro-inflammatory uh, 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 parameters, and recently we used also the AKI biomarkers. Plus, need of vasopressor is one of the most important aspects uh, that uh, trigger uh, the application of this uh, uh, therapy. Okay, uh, uh, we have some other questions that we may try to answer later. I would like now to try to get quickly the experience of our other speakers. One is uh, Dr. Sayed Mohamed Reza Esayan from Iran. Are you there? Probably is not. Well, why we'll see, uh, we'll try to see, uh, is Omar Mayushud from Morocco? Are you there? Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello. Do you hear me? Yes. Buongiorno. Buongiorno. Can Thank you. you tell us a little, can you tell us about, about your experience? Thank you, Professor uh, Ronco, for the invitation. It's an honor for me to participate in this webinar with great figures of nephrology, Professor Peng and the eminent panelists from China, Iran, and Thailand. Uh, in Morocco, North Africa, the situation to date is uh, as follows. We have uh, 574 confirmed cases with uh, 33 deaths and 15 recovery. We think uh, that the, the situation is still under control in Morocco. We are at the third week after the lockdown of the country. Uh, Morocco has taken strict social distancing measure early, but incidence cases are still increasing. Okay. Are you using uh, extracorporeal therapies? Omar? Omar? Well, he might have lost the connection. In the meantime, can we uh, hear from uh, Natachai Srizawat uh, from Thailand? Hi, Professor Ronko, can you hear me? Yes. So can I share uh, the screen? Yes, please. Uh, uh, so, can you see my slide? Okay, yes, we see it. Uh, right now in Thailand, uh, we have uh, the total case in the country about 5, uh, 1,500 cases and about 10, 10 of uh, cases die from the COVID-19. And our hospital, uh, King Cholanongkorn Memorial Hospital, we have uh, at least uh, 60 cases admitted in our hospital with about uh, 11 cases as a severe case. Uh, we have a chance to try the A330 uh, hemoperfusion in uh, three cases of the severe COVID-19. I just uh, summarize. Um, this case is a uh, all of them have an uh, exposure history like a uh, the occupation like a taxi driver or the nightclub musician, and um, most of them have no anti in disease. And uh, this is the the case that we tried the uh, HA three three zero. Of uh, around one hundred to uh, three hundred, and. Um, uh, one cases has a severe uh, acute kidney injury. And this is uh, the medication that uh, the patient received all the standard treatment, including the antiviral uh, medication and also the chloroquine and also the acetromycin. Uh, we, uh, in one case, we uh, doing the CRRT and the other, uh, no. And in one case, we also try the HA330 before the uh, uh, mechanical ventilation. And this is our uh, protocol. We perform uh, HA330 
uh, four hour in one case and six hour for the other two case. And the time duration we perform two days consecutively with the blood flow rate around 250 ml per minute. And this is the PF ratio um, before and after the treatment. You can see the, the improvement of the PF ratio with the declining of uh, the endotoxin activity assay. Most of the case we have a chance to check the endotoxin activity assay also. The second case, we do not found a difference much between before and after the treatment. This is the last case. Uh, the, there is a markedly improvement of the PF ratio after the treatment from around 120 up to 250 and the endotoxin level coming down. This is an x-ray on the first case. Uh, Day five is the, severe, uh, the, the more severe. And after the treatment, uh, there are some improvement of the x-ray. The second case, we do not find much difference be be before and after the treatment in terms of the x-ray. And the last case, we found a markedly improvement of the x-ray after the treatment. That's, that's, that's all my presentation. And I also have also the question for you also, like a, uh, what is like a standard protocol that we should think about when we apply a replication in COVID-19? Any serious side effect that we need to consider? And also uh, comparing between cytokine absorber and tocilizumab. What, what is your strategy to use these two uh, uh, treatment? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, your presentation uh, gives me uh, the opportunity to uh, suggest uh, if the uh, speakers and the attendees of this meeting want to share uh, their three, four, five cases uh, treated so far, this could be the perfect way to report and uh, we could actually make a joint publication uh, uh, all together. Um, afterwards, before we finish the meeting, I will send you my email uh, so that we can actually uh, see how many people will be interested, how many patients we can collect, and uh, finally, we should try to uh, use uh, maybe the reporting uh, style of uh, Professor uh, uh, Natachai uh, because uh, it, it was very, very clear. In the meantime, I see now Professor Sayed. Uh, you're back. Can you, yes, I'm can here. You tell us, are you, can you tell uh, yes, us your uh, experience? Are you, yes, uh, are you uh, listening? Can you tell us your experience? Yes. Uh, are you hearing me? Yes, Natachai, stop, stop sharing the, the desktop, please. Sure, sure. Okay. 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 Uh, Very good. Thank you. We uh, see you. Thank slide. you, Professor. Yeah. Yeah, but thank you, Professor. And this is my honor to speak with you and uh, other colleagues from uh, the connection is really unstable. We cannot hear you. Sayed, the connection is not uh, stable. We, we lost you. We will try. We will try to connect uh, uh, to connect later on. Because oh,
we can't hear you. Uh, okay, uh, Ranita, can you can you tell us your experience? How are you? Yes, fine. I I like to to share the screen now. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, let me show you. Uh, right right now, I work in the uh, COVID ICU of Silila uh, Hospital uh, in Bangkok, Thailand. And up to now, we just have uh, not so much kids, approximate uh, six or seven kids. I have tried uh, uh, cytokine absorbent therapy in three kids, but here I, I want to show only two kids. But the first case is the, is the man. Did, did you listen to me? Hello? Did you listen to you me? Have to, you have to share the, the, the screen. Share screen? Uh, you have to one. share screen. Okay. 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 This is okay right now? Yes. Now we see it. Yes. Okay. For, all right. For the first case, uh, he is a man, 70 years old man, approximately BMI of 30s and uh, was diagnosed uh, COVID-19 after locate fever for three days. After that, we start treatment with lopinavir, eritronavir, and colloquine. However, uh, on, days, uh, on day nine of, of therapies, uh, the clinical going bad, like uh, he has so severe hypoxemia, then we have to change to high flow nasal cannula and change again to NIV. This uh, chest X-ray show that uh, 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 increase in the pulmonary infiltration like ARDS uh, from day three to day uh, 12. And as you can see, we have to use the NIV high flow, for example. After that, we add the treatment like uh, Favipilavir, which is the standard treatment for, for severe pneumonia in Thailand. But the clinical uh, at that time was not improved. Uh, going down of like uh, of abnormal chest X-ray with the with the uh, PF ratio uh, approximate 180. Then we start with uh, methylpenicillin 1.5 milligram per kilo per day. However, uh, we we cannot improve the oxygenation. So uh, on the 14 days of his symptom, we start treatment with uh, HA um, P30s, and then we then the uh, oxygenation was improved. Like as I can show you in this case, we treat with HA P30 from day 14 to day 18. You can see the improvement in terms of. Uh, CRP and oxygenation. For the chest X-ray, you can see that the chest X-ray, which is uh, the worst on day 13 to day 14, but after that, the chest X-ray improved. Here is the comparison between uh, uh, chest X-ray on day uh, 6 and at the end of treatment of HAT 30s, which improved mark improvement of oxygenations. For the second case, who is a Thai male, 47 year old with morbid obesity, uh, but he came to the hospital very late. Then we can diagnose after he already developed COVID-19 pneumonia on day 11 of, of his symptoms. And the, the management, including uh, uh, treatment with uh, every, everything like ritonavir, uh, lopinavir, uh, uh, favipilavir, but the chest x-ray going back on the symptom day uh, 15. At that time, the PF ratio uh, going down to 130. Then we provide position to him 
after prone position of after third prone position a little bit improvement of chest x-ray but we we cannot prone no more because of uh, his body weight is approximate one one hundred and ten kilogram then we think about the hemoperfusion then we treat with hemoperfusion with HAT 30s on day T, but on the symptom day 24. After treatment, you can see we can improve the oxygenation and shed X-ray after uh, five sessions of treatment. And here is the, the cytokine level decrease the of CRP from 220 to 48 and PF ratio mark improvement. At that, at, at now, he can uh, 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 rest, uh, he can ventilate spontaneously uh, without paralytic and uh, on the winning process at, the, at this time. So this is two cases which I want to show. Actually, I have another one case, but uh, he's just, just start the treatment, only two sessions, so we have to wait for the result of this case. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I have, uh, I have uh, uh, more questions that uh, are coming here. One of the question is, uh, did you also do endotoxin removal? Well, we personally had two cases in which we found procalcitonin increasing dramatically and there was clearly a superimposed uh, bacterial infection. This led us to measure endotoxin assay and uh, we actually applied two sessions of uh, uh, endotoxin removal in two subsequent days. Um, let me... me Excuse me. Uh, for for me, I I make sure uh, procalcitonin also, but no problem with procalcitonin after. Did you hear me? After after treatment, yes. after five treatment, uh, after five session of of HAT thirties, no problem with procalcitonin at all for for my cases. So uh, the okay. procalcitonin decreased and then. We did not measure the level of endotoxin for, for our case. Uh, and Ranita, you can stop sharing your uh, screen now. Okay. Uh, another question is uh, with the increasing number of cases, how to best utilize the limited number of ICU beds? I think that this is a very local logistics uh, uh, problem that uh, needs to be addressed uh, locally. In our hospital, they had to expand the number of ICU beds, doubling the possibility of uh, uh, getting patients into the ICU. Um, can we combine CRRT and uh, uh, HA380, yes, absolutely. Uh, let me look at the other question. Um, I can ask Peng, they are asking, what do you think about using serum ferritin as a secondary outcome in adequacy of hemoperfusion. You have to unmute. Okay. Okay. So uh, actually, uh, I haven't measured this uh, uh, market. Uh, uh, for our patients. Nata Chai, did you? Uh, which one? Uh, did you measure ferritin before and after hemoperfusion? We have, we have the ferritin uh, as a marker of uh, inflammation before and after, yeah. But we did not show the result here. But we also check the endotoxin uh, level also before and after the treatment. Okay. Okay. Um, 
Let me see other questions. Uh, in Latin America, the most frequent uh, are intermittent standard. Question if the absorption device can use with this therapy. Uh, yes, uh, uh, absorption can be used in conjunction with intermittent therapies, definitely. Uh, hemodynamic stability is the issue for the patient, but if you have no, uh, let's say, if you have no uh, uh, other option, intermittent therapy can certainly be done. Uh, then I have a question from Daniel Hoye. Many, how many percent of the Italian people do you think will be infected? Well, it is difficult to know because it depends very much on how many uh, swab tests you do. Uh, if you don't do swab tests in everyone, how do you know what is the percent of infected population? Certainly, we can have uh, information about a patient with symptoms and I must say that here in the Veneto region, in the north of Italy, we were pretty lucky compared to Lombardy, which is another region where the uh, level of uh, uh, infections was much higher. What you can definitely measure is the number of deaths. And this tells you exactly, once uh, the epidemic will be perfectly understood if you know that the deaths are in the range of two to three percent uh, then you know how many people will be infected certainly uh, it seems that mortality in italy is higher than other countries but i suppose that this uh, depends on the reporting uh, and uh, this is uh, uh, one question another question is does oxiris have sufficient absorption capacity well, sufficient uh, is difficult to define because we don't have uh, the term adequacy concerning uh, uh, absorption capacity. Nevertheless, oxiris seems to have absorption capacity as also polymethyl metacrylate has. And I think that this could be a, an excellent option to continue a therapy with CRRT with the, with the membrane that can actually provide also absorption. Uh, can we do hemoabsorption with conventional hemodialysis machine? Yes, you can. Uh, what is the longest time I can use hemoperfusion? Uh, there are reports uh, uh, from China that have used for 12 hours the cartridges, but uh, they, they show clearly saturation after uh, six to eight hours. So I think that uh, four hours is probably today the best compromise. <coughs> Uh, we think that this is the right time for a randomized control trial. Uh, well, yes, but this will have an enormous cost and uh, will be uh, not easy to, to perform. But uh, I don't know who is send this, but if you have the funding to do a randomized trial, we will be happy to, to organize it. Um, did you do viral absorption with the hemopurifier filter? Uh, hemopurifier is another sorbent that has been used to remove viral particles. However, COVID-19 disease seems to have low levels of uh, virus level in the blood and therefore this cannot be probably a perfect, uh, a perfect treatment. Uh, Friends from Peru ask if we can use uh, intermittent therapy or sled therapies with hemoperfusion. Yes. Uh, what is the best suggested anticoagulation scheme? Uh, I can say that we use approximately 10 units of heparin per kilogram per hour. Uh, do you have uh, a different indication, Ranita? Pardon? Pardon? Uh, yes. Uh, all, all of my kids did not have AKI anymore. And uh, I, I use only hemofiltration, uh, uh, sorry, hemoabsorption, but uh, not, not, uh, no, no one need uh, RRT or CRRT. And what, what, uh, question, sorry. 
No, no, the, the optimal anticoagulation scheme. Oh, be, because uh, the, uh, uh, my duration is quite, quite different from uh, uh, yours. Uh, I do the hemoperfusion uh, only three hours. So it's not, no, no problem at all with anticoagulation because uh, for other 20 to 21 hours, we clone the patient. So we supply the patients after, uh, after nursing care, uh, we do with hemofiltration for three hours. After that, we prone and then we see every day, only three hours. Because uh, uh, I think that the absorption therapy may be maximized approximately three or four hours. And I, I see the, uh, the, the, uh, the benefit effect of prone position for this case. So we, I combine both treatments. Okay, I see that we also have, uh, we also have Professor Liang Yu in uh, in the in the meeting, and uh, he is probably able to share with us some of uh, uh, the experience he carried out in this patient. Professor Liang. Professor Liang? Professor Liang, are you there? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm here. Can you activate the video as well? Well, uh, can you see me? We, we can hear you. Can you activate the video? Yes, now we see you again. Okay, okay. So I don't have PPTs, but uh, I just have something to say. Uh, I'm from the first affiliate hospital of Zhejiang University. Uh, today I'm delighted to be here and to listen to the above two speeches from Professor Renko and you and Professor Pan. These two speeches just now uh, are very instructive. They bring us a first sign of clinical experience from the front line of this ongoing pandemic. So uh, today I want to come up with the uh, extracorporeal blood purification therapy for the COVID-19 patient. Uh, th that is what I did in the past two months. Our team leader, Professor Lan Zhen Li, has conducted a series of multi-center prospective controlled studies using uh, artificial liver support system to perform the blood purification therapies, including uh, plasma exchange, HA type hemoperfusion, and uh, hemofiltration to managing those criti critically ill patients. Uh, these uh, theoretical basis, uh, as uh, Dr. Rankel mentioned, uh, is that the overreacted immune response, or we can say the dysregulated cytokines are responsible for the progression of COVID-19 and the, the blood purification therapy can non-selectively remove those mediators from the circulation and may improve their outcome. Uh, in our study, uh, actually I, I'm responsible for the uh, HA type of hemoperfusion type uh, part. Uh, and we set up a control group with conventional treatment following the suggestion of Chinese guideline and a treatment group using blood purification therapies combined with the conventional treatment uh, and we found that there, there was a complex interplay between uh, various treatments, especially the use of uh, corticosteroids. You know, it is also recommended by the Chinese guideline. Uh, so in our study, I had some problem with uh, when analyzing data of cytokines. Uh, after the initiation of medical intervention, no matter uh, conventional treatment or HA treatment, uh, 
the, the, the cytokine level in both control group and treatment group were, were decreased. So, so I have a question is that how should I handle this part? Because there would be no significant difference in reduction of cytokines between the two groups. Uh, well, well that's, for, that's it for me. Thanks. Thank you very much. I think that the question you raise is something that I have tried to discuss before. Uh, if you take the, the cartridge and you elute at the end of the therapy uh, the substance absorbed, you can actually find cytokines absorbed, even though the circulating level has not changed. Yep. This may actually suggest uh, the concept that, that you are removing uh, substances that would have uh, otherwise have uh, intermittent or transient peak of concentration that may lead to organ damage. Uh, this is in fact demonstrated by the presence of the cytokine absorbed on the, on the cartridge, but also on the fact that uh, the half-life of this, uh, uh, of this uh, molecule is very, very short. So yeah. if you measure now or 10 minutes later, they might be very, very different in concentration. So uh, unfortunately, we have not available the generation rate of these substances. So we can only expect to uh, treat the patient uh, um, uh, modifying the possible peak of concentration. It's a kind of uh, preventive measure I think, and the rationale for this is there. Uh, it's very difficult to demonstrate, uh, and maybe in the future we will be able to do if we can monitor directly uh, at different time points cytokines concentration. Oh, thank you, thank you. That, that's an excellent point, Professor Renko. Uh, um, uh, I'm still handling the article, uh, and I, uh, that, that's very helpful to me. Thank you. Thanks again. Okay, now uh, what I would like to share with you is uh, this. Uh, this is uh, my email. Uh, let's see if I can actually. Uh, do you see my? Do you see my uh, yeah. email? Yes. Okay, if you see my email, yeah. uh, those of you who are interested in uh, sharing the experience and try to put together a paper, I've seen that uh, Guillermo Rosa Diaz, for example, has also suggested to, to try to make a, a, a kind of a registry or something like this. Uh, I might not have the time to put everything in order, but uh, I might ask, uh, for example, uh, Ranita or Professor Natachai or Professor Liang Yu to collaborate to put together, uh, once we have the data, a very nice spreadsheet uh, in which we can actually report at least uh, a large number of cases with improvement in uh, respiratory function, uh, pro-inflammatory things and others. Uh, I would like to I would like to give for one second, uh, uh, for one second, the word to Professor Maiju uh, that uh, unfortunately was blocked before. Uh, do you have a very quick, uh, a very quick statement? I'm sorry for the connection. Hello. Yes, we Hello. are here. Thank you, Professor Ronko. Uh, sorry for disturb. I was disconnected. Uh, I have said that the, uh, actually the situation in Morocco is still uh, under control. We don't have many, many cases. Uh, 1,500, uh, uh, about 15 to 1,600 confirmed cases. And uh, uh, in intensive care units, uh, uh, to my knowledge, we don't have many cases now for uh, severe cases with acute kidney injury. Uh, Moroccan Society of Nephrology have uh, published uh, 
his guidelines for the management of acute kidney injury in COVID-19 patients, where we specified the interest of continuous renal replacement therapies, hemoperfusion, and hemoadsorption. Uh, but uh, also, uh, as you know, uh, CRRT cannot be done everywhere in all facilities. So for some facilities, we have suggested to use, uh, if the CRRT are unavailable, uh, intermittent hemodialysis with the MCU uh, dialyzer. I want uh, to have uh, your opinion, Professor Rontu, about uh, the interest of MCU membranes in the elimination of cytokines in the absence of uh, uh, hemoperfusion cartridges. And also, I want to emphasize the importance for uh, countries where uh, medical teams are not uh, trained to do hemoperfusion and hemoabsorption to go uh, to countries where uh, there is a need to help and also to get experience in such therapies. Uh, also, uh, for countries where uh, uh, this therapy, these devices don't get marketing authorization, we need a fast track procedure to get the product quickly, save days, uh, allow us to save lives. And as the uh, ancient used to say, this pecare in bello no licite. In time of war, it's not permitted. <laughs> yes. Thank you. I think that was a was a wonderful statement, uh, Professor Sayed. Are you still there? You have my voice. Yes. We we hear you. Okay. Let me present a a 34-year-old man presented to the emergency department of hospital with complaints of high grade fever, cough and dyspnea for five days. And the uh, reverse transcription uh, polymer chain reaction, RT-PCR sample for COVID-19 was reported positive. And according to RT-PCR tests and clinical symptoms, the diagnosis of COVID-19 was made for the patient. The next slide. The therapeutic regimen. The therapeutic regimen based on hydroxychloroquine at dose of 200 mg T of BID and looking over at a dose of 20, 15 mg per T of BID. And after four days, the clinical condition of of the patient was deteriorated and he was subjected to prone intubation for invasive mechanical ventilation. The peripheral oxygen saturation decreased to 82 percent. The chest X-ray imaging showed the progressive infiltrations. You see here the chest X-ray of the patient during the hospitalization. The next slide showing the chest X-rays. Do you see the next slide? Please. Okay. These are the chest x ray of the patient during the hospitalization. The A is at admission time, B is a four day hospitalization, and the charge time. Okay. Then the cytokine cascade in patients with new coronavirus is linked of this in critical patients. The sixth edition of diagnosis treatment. Scheme for novel coronavirus pneumonia introduced the use of hemoperfusion as extracorporeal blood purification technique in critical. with the high inflammatory. Yeah. 
in combination of C P or the E R D S. This is everything we reported. A successful case to represent our experience of extracorporeal blood purification in patients with confirmed COVID-19 pneumonia. This case responded to hemoperfusion and CRT with a remarkable complication. We did uh, at least eight patients in our, house, uh, our hospital and we are doing in our country lots of filtrations, and we are doing CRT and hemoperfusion. We are doing ECMO and hemoperfusion, and these are very, very nice for our patients for better oxygenation and reduce the acute kidney injury tables in our patients in the COVID-19. Then we are very, uh, uh, and we doing everything based on the protocols that the Chinese and uh, they did in their country, and uh, we are doing the CRT based on the universal guidelines, and appreciate professor for giving me a chance speaking about our cases here. Okay, uh, so with this, uh, you can actually stop sharing the, the video, perfect. And with this, uh, I would like to thank all the speakers. I would like to ask uh, Peng to stay for a few minutes uh, and all the others can leave. But still, remember, we will try to communicate by email. And uh, if you guys are interested in doing uh, this uh, uh, paper and case collection all together, we will ask uh, the young members of our team here to act uh, uh, to be very active and then we will share uh, possibly we will make a very nice paper for a, a very high impact journal with this i thank you very much i thank the organizer uh, for uh, having uh, organized this uh, symposiums this webinar i think it was just uh, fantastic to share all the experiences we have just to let you know 188 questions uh, we could not answer all of them but i tried to answer those who were mostly uh let's say uh closer uh one to the other and with this uh, again thank you very much to everyone